welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit MacroHive.com. Greetings, Stephen. It's great to have you back on the podcast show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Now, the, one of the reasons I wanted to call you back on was that you've recently published a book, uh, The Accidental Conflict, America, China, and the Clash of False Narratives. It's a really uh, good and well-reasoned book. Um, and so I, I guess one basic question is, what, what uh, inspired you to write this book at, for this time? Well, I've been involved in um, the U.S.-China relationship probably for about 25 years. And, um, you know, I've seen the, the ebb and flow, the highs and the lows. And I, I, get, I, I guess I look back on that period and, and find that I was getting very frustrated about uh, a lot of false impressions that are flying back and forth uh, from both sides. And this started me initially thinking about why it's so important uh, to um, uh, distort or confuse or not pay careful attention to getting ideas right. And, you know, my conclusion was that, you know, irrespective of the political system, and of course, they're very different in, um, in both countries, that um, unfortunately it has become politically expedient to duck problems and blame them on someone else. This is true of politicians um, in, in the United States, for sure. And it's increasingly true, even in a one-party political system like China, uh, to deflect the um, source of a problem uh, to uh, an external uh, uh, antagonist rather than to admit the, the problem itself. And so then I started thinking about less about motives and more about just collecting uh, narratives on both sides of the relationship that were particularly um, destructive and problematic uh, in um, uh, creating a, a more stable framework of engagement between the two countries. And out of that came a book proposal, and then uh, three years later came a book. Oh, that's excellent, and, and it's a really well-written book. So maybe we can start with those narratives. You, In your book, you describe these as false narratives on both sides. So U.S. has a false narrative about China, and China has a false narrative about the U.S. Maybe you could describe what those false narratives are. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, first of all, I mean, I, I'm not trying to single out uh, one nation, one government, one leader, or the other. I think I have eight chapters on false narratives in the book, four each for uh, America's false narratives of China and another four for China's false narratives of the U.S. And the, these chapters uh, comprise the bulk of the book and... Uh, there, there are many, many of them uh, in, in, in each uh, part of this uh, argument. And let me just highlight um, one on each side. And if you want, we can certainly uh, pursue more. Uh, the U.S. has long felt that um, uh, China is the culprit uh, in the trade deficit, which puts pressure on uh, companies and workers and communities uh, and is guilty of a wide range of unfair trading practices that um, uh, create uh, this extraordinary state of hardship. This is a strong view of administration after administration, but uh, you know, reached ahead in um, the Trump administration is really the the springboard for the uh, U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer's um, Section 301 investigation uh, against China that was published in March of 2018, 
that became the foundational evidence uh, in support of the tariffs and sanctions that were to follow, and that amazingly enough in the Biden administration still remain in place. And my argument there is yes, as in most false narratives, there, there is fact supporting the fact that, that we have a trade deficit. There's no question about it. And the trade deficit itself does create problems for um, uh, companies and workers uh, in communities. But trade deficits do not occur in a vacuum. And this is where I attack this deficit as being, uh, um, or this narrative as being false. Trade deficits are an outgrowth of a deficiency in domestic saving. When nations don't save and they want to grow, uh, they have to run uh, current account deficits to attract the foreign capital. And the current account deficit uh, is what drives uh, not a deficit against any one country like China, but a multilateral trade deficit against many, many countries. Last year, for example, we had multilateral trade deficits uh, with 106 different countries. The Chinese piece is the largest, although it's come down considerably um, since the tariffs were uh, put on by, by President Trump starting in 2018. But um, that hasn't reduced the overall trade deficit. The macro theory tells you that if you don't raise your domestic savings rate, and we haven't, then you you can uh, reduce uh, the bilateral trade deficit with any one country through tariffs and or sanctions, but that piece then gets diverted to others. And that's exactly what happened um, uh, to um, America's multilateral trade deficit, which hit a new record last year. Uh, and the, while well, the Chinese piece uh, came down, it was diverted to other higher cost uh, trading partners like um, uh, you know, Canada, uh, Mexico, uh, and a number of other Asian uh, nations. So, uh, yes, we have a trade deficit. Uh, the false narrative is that um, we can fix it. Uh, by leaning heavily on China. And I address this uh, in a chapter um, in the book called Bilateral Bluster, where I, excuse me, not only lay out the um, the economics of the multilateral trade deficit, but I would say I um, am pretty aggressive in tearing apart the Section 301 report of Robert Lighthizer is one that is based on... Um, uh, poor analytics uh, and shoddy evidence, to put it politely. So that's Stephen, just 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 on that, um, you know, there is an argument that the issue is not so much that the U.S. has a savings problem; it's that China and other export nations uh, say too much, you know, because they suppress. Um, uh, you know, domestic consumption and over over export, overproduce, which is an argument laid out by people like Michael Pettis, and that you would end up end up with countries with large uh, capital markets that end up absorbing that uh, excess savings from from uh, those countries. So he he sort of the emphasis then gets pushed towards the exporters rather than to to the importing nations. Um, how do you think about? Do you think that's a valid argument? Yeah, I think it's a perfectly valid argument, but. It... It, it boils down to the you know the, the chicken or the egg. Mm -hmm. Both parties are equally culpable in creating these savings imbalances. And uh, I talk about this a lot in 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 the book as well. That China's failure to really uh, rebalance and restructure its economy uh, and um, shift. <clears throat> economic output uh, away from exports and investment, I would add, uh, to a structure that's supported more by internal private consumption is a serious problem for sustainable growth in China and a serious problem in creating the types of um, 
trade and protectionist tensions that China uh, is is facing. But it, you know, I I I hold China uh, responsible for that. But on the other hand, you know, that doesn't excuse you know America's um, open ended uh, budget deficits and um, asset based savings encouraged by the Federal Reserve for depleting its own domestic reservoir of saving. It's not as if uh, the, the U.S. is the world's most powerful economy, uh, is doing the world a huge favor by consuming to excess uh, and by um, squandering its long-term growth by failing to save. So I think um, both nations um, are at fault here and, and you know, there's always a temptation to blame one or the other, and I hold them, you know, in my magnanimous spirit of, of trying to be balanced, equally responsible for creating this problem. And then on the other side, what's the China? What China's one of the, the what's one of the false narratives on the Chinese side about the U.S.? Well, we, you know, I just just touched on it, but I'll I'll, I'll take it into the false narrative structure. In February of this year, Xi Jinping uh, said um, on the sidelines of the uh, <clears throat> uh, the twin sessions that um, the United States uh, is responsible uh, for all around containment, encirclement, and suppression uh, of China to the point that that is inhibiting um, China's uh, long-term prospects for growth and development. Well, like most false narratives, you know, he's got part of it right. Um, it's hard for me to deny, although Washington has been doing this for a long time, that uh, the U.S., in fact, is not aiming to contain um, uh, China. I think our policies of uh, containment have really uh, been crystallized not just by uh, the Trump administration, but also by the uh, the efforts that are still ongoing from the Biden administration with respect to advanced technology. We want to contain uh, China. But to blame America's containment policies uh, for China's failed uh, economic development, I think, is is the false piece of this narrative. China has no one to blame other than itself, uh, and this is the point we addressed earlier, uh, for uh, failing to put in place the types of reforms, especially to its social safety net, that would um, uh, reduce fear-driven precautionary saving by a rapidly aging uh, Chinese population uh, that would then encourage uh, much more uh, open-ended um, discretionary consumption. This is on China's uh, watch, not on uh, a, a reflection of America's uh, containment uh, 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 efforts that have been so uh, pronounced uh, in, in recent years. And by deflecting attention away from China's own failed strategy and reforms, um, you know this this has become a serious a source of conflict uh, from the Chinese perspective as well. And you know something that's been discussed a lot in foreign policy circles, at least in recent years, has been the so-called Thucydides trap of you know transitioning from one empire to another. Do you put much weight on that? That you've had you know U.S. Uh, hegemony and China's rising up, so there has to be a, a handover from one to the other, and so there has implicitly there has to be this conflict. Well, I'll be perfectly honest with you. When I first read um, Graham Allison's um, articles and then his book on the Th Thucydides trap, I, I said to myself, you know, this is intriguing. It's interesting, but it it deals with um, conventional military outcomes from uh, historical conflicts between rising and ruling powers. And if you look at his um, 
tabulation of great power conflicts um, ever since the advent of the nuclear era, uh, you know, his, um, uh, his outcomes have not pointed uh, in the direction of, um, of, of what the trap, the Thucydides trap uh, would, would uh, suggest. So I, I tended to dismiss it. And then as I thought more and more about it, you know, then uh, uh, became extremely concerned after the, the Russian invasion of uh, uh, Ukraine and uh, Putin's reckless and irresponsible threat to use nuclear weapons. Um, I sort of told myself this is not something to uh, treat as lightly as I had. So I, I do take the uh the idea uh more seriously but whether or not it's a uh, uh a kinetic uh hot war type conflict or not i, th I think the the clash that's now evident between the united states and china is is worrisome for many of the reasons that graham allison uh, i think correctly uh, addressed uh, in a historical Context and you know in the last five years, we've quickly gone from a trade war to a tech war to the early skirmishes of a new cold war, uh, and you know my theory, if you want to call it that, of accidental conflict, um, uh, argues that the confluence of these false narratives, politically expedient false narratives on both sides of this. Uh, struggle uh, is sort of the high octane fuel of conflict escalation, and, and taking that you know that that image a bit further, you know, high octane fuel is very flammable, uh, and so it can be ignited by sparks. And needless to say, we've seen uh, plenty of sparks in Taiwan, the South China Sea. Um, uh, sparks with a, uh, a war in Ukraine and China with Russia's partner without limits um, in, in that context. Um, who knows, even a global recession, if it, if it occurs, and some people argue that you know, we're, we're close to that, you know, that's another spark to think about with this high-octane fuel of a dueling uh, false narrative. So I... I uh, Obviously, the, the the next stage of escalation from a Cold War, one that we worried about a lot uh, in the 60s and 70s, was a hot war. We came pretty close uh, with the Cuban Missile Crisis and the, the Berlin Crisis. Uh, but, um, you know, responsible uh, and moral leadership ultimately prevailed. Do we still have that? Uh, to rely on today, I, I don't. I hope so, but I'm not sure we can take that for granted. And you know, of course, one of the other kind of events, obviously, has been COVID. I mean, how how do you think COVID has affected this dynamic between the U.S. and China? Well, it clearly uh, was a shock, and um, you know, COVID. I spend a lot of time. Uh, talking about it uh, in in the book uh, because it 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 occurred uh, in the midst of this worrisome uh, outbreak of conflict escalation and immediately became <clears throat> politicized as so many of these false narratives do and we're still in the midst of a very contentious debate over the. Uh, the, the COVID origins issue, uh, the lab accident was it was it a, did it, did it actually occur or not? Uh, and if it did, were there ulterior ulterior deliberate motives to that? Um, you know, the conspiracy theorists in the United States continue to just push this one very very hard, and yet. Um, time and time again, the intelligence community comes up with the fact that we do, can't really uh, ascertain with any validity 
uh, the, the origins, the cause, and the motives behind it. But it has served the unfortunate purpose of just intensifying uh, uh, the toxic political climate um, between the two nations. Um, it not only feeds the U.S. conspiracy theorists, but from the Chinese side, whenever it's mentioned, uh, you know, they go into a you know a, a very intense wolf warrior drill uh, and blast the United States, and and so it's 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 just emblematic of how uh, highly uh, toxic the political climate has come between um, these you know, two leading superpowers. And you mentioned earlier that, you know, Biden has essentially continued Trump's policies towards uh, China. He hasn't reversed um, any, any of the you know, trade uh, barriers that they uh, had imposed. Is that because COVID was such a big distraction that they haven't got around to it? Or is it more that Biden actually agrees with those policies? No, administration. I, I think it's neither. I think it goes back to the point we started out with, and that is um, it remains politically expedient hmm. uh, in the United States uh, for Washington, whether it's Republicans or now Democrats, uh, to um, blame China for uh, many of the problems that have been uh, identified as um, serious threats uh, to long-term prosperity uh, in uh, the, the U.S. And so, you know, I, I, for one, was was pretty darn surprised when Biden um, was sworn into office on day one, January 20th, um, <clears throat> Uh, 2021, um, he is sworn into office and he signs over a dozen executive orders, uh, reversing some of the most outrageous um, policies of the Trump administration, uh, construction of the border wall in Mexico, the, the Muslim travel ban. He rejoined um, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. He rejoined the World Health Organization, but he did nothing uh, to reverse Trump's uh, China policy, he did nothing to roll back the tariffs, the sanctions, and if anything, has tightened the news further uh, in uh, uh, the first two years of his administration, especially uh, in going after uh, uh, advanced uh, technology. And when Biden didn't take advantage of the, the, the narrow honeymoon window that a new incumbent president has, um, you know, in the first months of his uh, new administration, uh, I knew that, you know, the, the, the politics, especially given his razor thin majority in the U.S. Congress at the time, uh, would um, uh, not, not really give him the opportunity. Uh, to, to make a change. And his uh, new trade representative, um, Catherine Tai, has continued to, uh, uh, I think, examine uh, China's trading practices through the unfortunate lens of her predecessor, um, Robert Lighthizer, uh, and uh, continues to raise serious concerns about China's uh, compliance or lack thereof with this uh, phase one trade deal that was negotiated by the Trump administration, uh, which, from my point of view, was a horrible uh, deal that that didn't accomplish anything and laid out a framework that is completely inconsistent with the theory I laid out at the beginning that trade deficits. <clears throat> Uh, cannot be reduced by focusing on a bilateral piece of a multilateral problem. It's bad economics uh, and it's um, you know, a political uh, blame game uh, at it, it, its worst. So uh, 
you know, Biden, Biden inherited a mess from Trump, but, but doesn't have the political capital uh, that he's willing to spend uh, to get out of it. And as uh, I think um, uh, pushed um, the, the conflict uh, to a, um, uh, an even tougher level as a result. And earlier you talked about some of the necessary reforms China needs uh, to restructure its economy. So you mentioned introducing a social safety net, which would reduce the precautionary savings, help uh, have other policies to promote private consumption and so on. Uh, on the US side, what should Biden do to raise the savings rate uh, of the US economy so that it doesn't then uh, rely on trying to capture excess savings from abroad? Well, the top three items on America's savings agenda are uh, the budget deficit, the budget deficit, and the budget deficit. Uh, <laughs> okay. And, um, you know, we continue to spend uh, freely. Uh, and the, the long-term budget outlook is um, uh, laid out by the Congressional Budget Office uh, is worrisome under the best of terms, which would have been a uh, continuation of near zero interest rates. But now as interest rates are being normalized by the Federal Reserve, uh, the, the, the debt sustainability issues um, are far more uh, disconcerting. Uh, and that, of course, brings in the idea of uh, needing uh, foreign lenders uh, to fund our economy, and uh, our China had been our largest foreign lender. It's now slightly behind uh, Japan, but it's it, you know accounts for a large portion uh, of our external uh, uh, indebtedness, and you know that, that gives them you know a fair amount of uh, leverage. Uh, should we continue to turn the screws on them uh, in the trade, tech, and uh, Cold War uh, skirmishes. But, you know, we need to get our, you know, our house in order in terms of uh, long-term saving if, if we're going to continue to um, uh, focus on our long-term uh, growth goals ourselves in terms of investing uh, in uh, domestic capacity and in infrastructure uh, and in educational reform and human capital to say nothing of funding our uh, entitlements. So uh, saving is the seed corn of, of, of future economic growth. And nations who do not save ultimately have growth problems. And uh, you know, we, we need to take that, uh, I think, that message much more seriously than we have. Now, you recently wrote uh, an op-ed in the Financial Times talking about the relationship between US and China, and you had a proposal of how uh, you or we could kind of somehow uh, reduce the tensions between uh, the, the two countries. I mean, could you talk a bit more about what your idea was? Yeah, it's a proposal for what I call a US-China secretary. And it, you know, it, it stems from an idea that I did first introduce in the book, Accidental Conflict, in the final chapter, but I've since written more about it in detail that um, uh, with, with a little bit of a finer touch than, than I did uh, in uh, the book. And it starts with the idea that, you know, diplomacy is an art. Uh, that has long been practiced by uh, major uh, countries, <clears throat> but ultimately it's it's a uh, an effort at uh, bilateral and multilateral engagement that uh, takes its legitimacy from domestic politics. Uh, diplomats are never going to stray from uh, their own domestic political moorings and you know we every once in a while we have a a diplomatic breakthrough that is extraordinarily important from a historical point of view uh richard nixon went to china in 1972 and uh, with the uh, 
support of Henry Kissinger, who was just back there um, this week, 52 years later, um, they really made a, an important strategic breakthrough in bringing China back into the world um, after the, the, the tumultuous years uh, of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution uh, and set the stage for what initially was a very constructive uh, U.S.-China relationship. But things have gone downhill, um, and for reasons that we've already discussed, uh, and, you know, the, the diplomats, what worries me is that the diplomats are hard at work in trying to create uh, sort of a, a new thaw in this conflict in, you know, the last few weeks, we've seen the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Treasury, uh, and now the, the climate envoy, John Kerry, um, make missions to Beijing, uh, missions that have accomplished nothing other than to talk again, but there's been no breakthrough, no uh, conflict resolution. Uh, and what they seem to be aiming toward is resurrecting um, an approach that failed uh, in the past, um, beginning with the uh, Bush II administration in 2006 and continuing through the Obama administration, we've had something called the Strategic um, and Economic Dialogues twice a year under Bush II, once a year under Obama. Uh, and they uh, were great, you know, glorious uh, exercises basically in event planning, but nothing uh, major ever came out of that. And it now seems based on, um, you, know, the, you know, the views expressed by Janet Yellen and others, that we'd love to go back to something like that again. And I, I think that uh, is a, an unproductive uh, effort. So my proposal for a U.S.-China secretariat is to set up um, a full-time organization staffed by equal but large complements of U.S. and Chinese professionals, um, call them technocrats if you want, who are well-versed um, in a broad um, number of issues that the two nations are involved in, from trade and technology uh, to uh, economic structures to the subsidies of uh, government activities to to the big uh, mega issues such as uh, global health, uh, climate change, uh, cybersecurity, and yes, even human rights, and that the organization be located in a, a neutral venue, call it Switzerland, Sing Singapore if you prefer, uh, but not in the U.S. or not in China, uh, and the um, the organization uh, really be um, focused on addressing, from a collaborative point of view, uh, issues uh, past, present, and prospectively in the future that are of critical importance uh, to not just the relationship, but to the long-term uh, prosperity of both nations uh, and uh, the world. The secretary should have a, a troubleshooting and convening power so that um, when problems arise, such as COVID-19 that we've already discussed, they it would be natural for them to convene uh, a panel of uh, scientists, um, epidemiologists, uh, public health practitioners uh, to uh, understand and address uh, a pandemic rather than point fingers and turn it into political theater. Or that when a balloon is um, found, uh, a surveillance balloon found to be uh, hovering over um, in the United States, uh, especially over missile sites uh, in, in, in the Midwest, that there would be a, um, a backstop 
of uh, uh, hotline capacity for uh, not just the military to speak to one another, but to, you know, have senior level uh, diplomats and um, executives, uh, branches of, of both nations be in direct communication to avoid uh, a very dangerous conflict escalation. The same with, you know, near misses in uh, on the seas in the Taiwan Strait or in the air over the South China Sea, both of which have occurred in in in, in recent months. Um, and finally, the Secretariat should have a uh, dispute screening function uh, where when the inevitable issues arise between two nations, whether it's in compliance with existing agreements or uh, potentially new agreements, that um, the disputes be um, evaluated uh, and uh, procedures be set up uh, aimed at dispute resolution. Uh, and if that doesn't work, then then the, the, the dispute would be escalated uh, up to higher uh, global authority. So uh, I think we need uh, a new approach. The old approach has failed. Uh, we seem to be uh, longing for uh, going back to the type of approach we had before, the approach that put us in this mess in the first place. And so my proposal is a fairly radical uh, proposal to have a permanent uh, organization oversee this uh, relationship. Uh, and um, my uh, uh, opinion piece in the Financial Times uh, stress that um, you know the old way is broken. We need a new way. This may not be the perfect answer. I'm more than willing to hear uh, alternative suggestions for a better approach. And I guess what you're really saying here is that in the absence of approaches like what you've suggested with the Secretariat, we are on a on a bad track. You know, you mentioned earlier you characterize it as we've gone from trade war, tech war to potentially a cold war. So the tra the direction of travel isn't great. So we need something more creative or imaginative to to break us out of this. Uh, uh, yeah, I this... mean, you know, Biden and she uh, in in Bali last November said, you know, we want to put a floor on the relationship. Well, come on, we can do a floor is not uh, the answer uh, for. Um, you know, a conflict that has deteriorated as dramatically that it's it's a low bar uh, and one that reflects, I think, um, uh, the lack of political courage and vision uh, to really uh, build a a more productive uh, relationship uh, than we certainly have 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 now, and that we've had uh, in the last dozen years or so uh, as well. And so we we need a structure that not just provides a floor or not just provides guardrails, but one that is proactive in troubleshooting um, uh, existing and potential problems uh, in in the future. And by uh, you know collaborative work, I, I would envision, uh, both sets of, of, of experts, uh, American and Chinese, uh, being housed together in the same physical building, uh, not working on separate floors or separate portions of the, uh, the secretary, but coming to work together every day. That's the way you, you rebuild uh, uh, trust uh, and collaboration at the professional level, which can spread into the political arena as well. Well, I think that's a it's a great note to to end our conversation and and you know once again congratulations on writing the book. The book is uh, called Accidental Conflict, and I assume Stephen one can buy that from all the usual outlets uh, online and bookshops and so on. You can do that. I would um, list them for you, but that would commercialize an otherwise um, uh, non-commercial uh, intellectual discussion that we've had and. Go to my website and you can find all the links you want. Yeah, great. And I'll include a, a link to your, your, your site in the show notes as well. So once again, thank you very much, Stephen. Excellent conversation as usual. And, and uh, uh, it's great that you wrote, wrote the book as well.
Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure to speak with you again and all the best to you. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five-star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.